most important idea I ever had. Probably choosing to rap. In 2004, a young man from Gary, Indiana had an idea. A 20-something with no clear direction, Freddie Gibbs had been drifting between college, the U.S. Army, and the streets when he realized that a talent he had taken for granted, rapping, might be the catalyst his life needed. After dropping a few mixtapes locally, Gibbs caught the attention of Interscope intern Ben Lambo Lambert, who championed his talent and got the building to pay attention. Unfortunately, despite years of recording and demonstrative growth, the deal would ultimately fail to yield an album and Freddie would find himself dropped. But rather than the end, this sizable setback was actually just the beginning for Gibbs. In the ensuing decade, he would climb from underground obscurity to universally acknowledged legend, with a litany of classic albums, sold out shows, and even a 2021 Grammy nomination in his wake. And it all started with one idea. What did your parents do for work? My mom was a postal worker for 30 years. I know my mom worked hard every day up until I was probably like uh, seven to eight. My dad was a police officer. He was like probably like in between jobs like his whole life after that. He'll like do something for a year or two and quit. Maybe it wasn't his calling. His calling was probably music because he, you know, he's a singer really. I think that his talent inspired me. So you were around entertainment and- Yeah, I watched my dad try to chase it. What was that feeling of watching him try to achieve something and not be able to get to it? You no know, rejection, just seeing him be you know, disappointed, you know, that was, uh, that was quite difficult. But uh, I definitely didn't uh, want to um, fuck with a career in music, you know, after seeing, you know, after looking at him struggle with that shit all those years. I don't know, man, I think God chose this for me. I really, I, tr I really didn't at all. Cause, uh, you know, growing up as a kid, uh, I definitely didn't want to be a fucking rapper. I always knew I was going to be something that wasn't regular, something that gave me a little bit more power than the next person. But I didn't know what it was. And, you know, this rap shit just kind of like found me, I think. After high school, you went to college to play ball, uh, football. Yeah. <laughs> were you thinking that that was going to be a professional step or were you just using that to get into school to see what happened? I didn't work as hard as I should have at, uh, at football either. Being young, being stupid, being in the streets, um, chasing girls, all kind of shit like that. After playing ball, you ended up enlisting in the army. Yeah, not on purpose. I had a, a charge that I was about to face and um, I had this recruiter <laughs> come to the court and they gave me this shit called pretrial diversion or something like that where I enlisted and charges kind of went away. Did you at any point buy into trying to make that a, a career or did you really just- No fucking way. It was just a solution to this problem? Solution to the fucking problem. Finish training in AIT and shit, get kicked out some kind of way. No fucking way. That was a nightmare. Did you learn anything from that? A whole lot. A whole lot of good came out of that, you know. Definitely taught me how to be more disciplined. A lot of things, uh, you know, as a man that I, you know, didn't get at home, I, uh, I got in that, in that, in that basic training shit, for sure, for sure. It definitely helped me, but I hated it. Were you considering music or thinking about music at that point in your life? No, not really. It was just like a play thing. My homies was, was rapping and stuff. And um, they was going to the studio and stuff like that. And I was just hanging around. Maybe I could like do something within the music shit. I don't know, be a DJ, a manager, uh, something like that. Some type of executive maybe, Really? you know? Should night type shit, you know what I'm saying? But shit, one day I just ended up rapping, man. And I never stopped. The competitor in me kind of like drove me to do it, I think, you know, me being competitive. And I just looked at it like, I don't know, like drugs. You know, you can make a hundred CDs and sell them and flip them. And, you know, I looked at it as like a hustle. And, you know, those motherfuckers that was like beefing with me and shit like that. Like I had like enemies and shit like that. And they was like shooting at me and shit and like putting that shit on like tapes, you know, like rapping about that shit. And I was like, fuck that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot at them and rap about it too. So. A lot of that music comes from like real street beats and real problems. Living that life exposes yourself to certain hazards, both Correct. physically, 
with law enforcement and also the mental stress associated with it. Right. Did you at that moment think of that as a long-term play or was that something that you knew that you were engaging with for a moment and trying to figure out how to get on to the next thing? I was good at rap like as soon as I started. You know, the shit I could do was amazing off top. Lambo found me, you know, when I was, you know, in Gary. So, you know, obviously he saw something. And I knew, you know, that I was, you know, definitely better than everybody around me. So I was just like, all right, I'm gonna really take it seriously. You know, because if they like him, oh yeah, they love me. I'm way better than them. And like once I got like 10 people to like me, then 100 people like me, then 500 people like me. Then I, How did you get the first 10 to like you? You know, just being in the streets, you know, get, being known, you know, in your city pretty much. And uh, taking it from there. I don't really chase anything creatively. I think it all just comes to me. You know, uh, I think that's the beauty of it. I think when you start chasing creativity, you start biting. How did you make enough noise in Gary to end up on Lambo's? I didn't. I didn't make enough noise in Gary at that point yet. Lambo just found the shit because he's just a <laughs> he just an internet geek. He, he got, you know, one of the best ears in the game. He dug the, out a diamond in the rough and the rest is history. What did you think when you got that first call from him? Oh, I hung up on him. I was like, yeah, right, nigga. Uh, it wasn't even from him. It was from this little intern motherfucker. And I was like, uh, whatever, nigga, send two tickets. And then they flew me and my homie to New York. And then uh, they put me on a bench for like, I don't know, probably like six months until they like worked out a deal for me. And then out of that, I came to California. Did you even like have a lawyer or any of that kind of stuff at that point? I had none of that shit. They gave me a lawyer. They gave me a manager, all of that shit. You know, I was just like, okay, I was fresh in the game. I figured if I would have like came with all of that type of shit and added pressure, then they wouldn't have fucked with me. You know, they looked at it like, look, man, we think you can rap, but like, you know, your music ain't that good. And it wasn't at that time. They was like, but well, we can make you put you in the studio and put you with real producers and you can like make real music. And I was like, all right. He got me over there in the scope. I just saw rap from a different playing field. I wasn't like rapping with these local guys anymore. I wasn't competing with them. I was, you know, at that point, all right, I'm competing against, you know, the world. It's like he took me out of high school and put me straight in the pros. And I had to like, you know, find my way from there, even when, you know, doors were starting to shut. Definitely uh, have self-doubt, but uh, that's just the devil trying to claw at you. So you just got to fight that. Once you get past that, then, you know, that's the key to conquering life, I think. What happened at Interscope that you ended up getting dropped and that I'm um, being shelved? Nothing happened. I wasn't ready yet, you know, as an artist. They weren't ready yet for me as a company. We didn't have a, a plan, a marketing plan, uh, you know, and that's, that's really the nuts and bolts of it. That was the time when you still needed radio and you, you, needed, Correct. you needed hits in order to there get- There was a lot of factors involved. Hits, yeah, you definitely needed that. You definitely needed radio. You needed like affiliation. I ain't had none of that. I was just a, you know, a lone wolf. So it was just like, yo, I gotta figure something out. So the labels were transitioning and, and just being really just banks and distributors. To be, to be honest, that whole A&R and thing, that development, development of an artist, that was out of the window when I got there. So I learned that at that stage, that's when all of that shit stopped. I got dropped Lambo. Um, didn't get a job, so we just created our own brand, pretty much, and just ran with it. Were they putting pressure on you as an artist to beat anything or to try to achieve anything? Nah, they was like, they, they kind of just gave me some beats and was like, go ahead and record. They probably forgot I was signed there, dog, to be honest. <laughs> it was just like some, a tax write-off situation. Yep. They gave me opportunity to learn some shit, you know, and I learned it. I equate that to like me finishing college. I got my degree in the music industry. If you could go back and give yourself any advice, what would that be? I don't know, because I wouldn't change shit. All of that uh, made me a better uh, businessman, better rapper, you know what I mean? I, I had to go through that experience to be you know, mentally prepared for the journey that I was about to go on. I had to get signed, see what the rap industry was about, get dropped, learn how to like pick myself up from that and uh, you know, create something that, you know, that ain't never been created. You mentioned being involved with some bad people. What do you mean by that? Everybody that I signed with was a bad deal. <laughs> Aside from like Gazi and like, you know, my, my new situation, everything that I've been involved in, 
contractually has been a bad situation. Do you think that was unique to you or do you think that's just the nature of the industry? That's the nature of the industry. When you're uh, talented without any uh, leverage, this game can kind of deal you whatever hand it wants to. Talent without leverage and you know means means nothing. It's tough to tell a good idea from a bad idea until you put it out there in the world, you know? That's like asking the NBA player, was it a good shot or a bad shot? It's a bad shot if you miss it, but it's a good shot if you hit it. Though the deal with Interscope fell apart in 2007, Gibbs remained undeterred. Over the following years, he would release music at a steady pace, slowly accruing accolades and fans. And before long, thanks to his boutique approach and tasteful collaborations, the seed that was his modest business model would soon bloom into a flourishing money tree. Was there ever a moment after getting dropped that you considered just giving it up? Yeah, hell yeah, definitely. You know, I didn't really know the, um, who was gonna wanna fuck with me after that. At that time, when you get dropped from a record label, you kinda like damaged goods. I don't think nobody else is gonna like sign me. Man, that was uh, depressing. Then I was just like, all right, well, I'm just gonna do it myself. If I gotta put my own money up to do it and continue doing that, then I'm gonna do that. I ain't accept nothing from nobody. I just literally pressed the gas and was like, all right, I'm gonna do this shit with whatever I gotta do. Before you, you went fully independent, you ended up doing the deal with CTE, um, right? I mean, if you call that a deal, yeah. I mean, we, I really, we was just chilling, smoking, and making songs that, you know, every once in a while. That was more rap school, you know what I mean? Uh, I definitely learned a lot um, being in that situation. I learned a lot from Jeezy. Just the, the aura uh, mm -hmm. of what Jeezy brought to the table. Why do you think that that sort of went the wrong way? Um, Just, just two guys with two uh, different visions of what they wanted to do. That's all. And it wasn't no gangster shit or nothing like that. <laughs> you have really carved your own lane in terms of how you approach both doing solo projects and then these collaborative albums. When you started to work independently, did you have a vision for all of that or did you build it as you go? I'm my own favorite rapper, so I know what I want to hear. Shit, I built Freddie Gibbs, so I was like, all right, you know, I'm, I can build it to be what I want it to be. The competitor in me wanted me to be, you know, one of the best rappers. And I'm gonna, you know, build this story, frame it the way I want to, and um, just making the music that I want to make without the pressure of uh, trying to like be on radio, trying to be on Billboard. Once I started like making money, it was just like shit. I don't really give a fuck about being the most popular motherfucker no more. You know, I cared about that when I was uh, trying to get a record deal. Like once my music started turning a profit and like people start coming to the shows and stuff like that, I stopped giving a fuck about that. I don't even count the money no more, man. I count the productivity. I'll produce the next person, I'll work the next person. Then everything that I want to do is going to happen. When you listen to other people's music, are you able to listen to it as a fan? It depends on who it is. If I feel like you in your own lane and I could just enjoy your music, yeah, then I'm just going to enjoy it. If I feel you're getting too close, you know, and I'm going to start listening to you as a competitor. You know what I mean? And you know, you don't really want me doing that. Do you see people following the moves that you've made and the, the sort of ground that you've broken? Definitely. It's a lot of people that have got rich off of, uh, you know, the shit that I've been, that I've, uh, the groundwork that I laid. I'm proud of them for that. But I definitely see the influence. More lyrics are starting to come out of the gate. Oh, but they could be as lyrical as all the fuck they want and rap as great as the fuck they think. They still, you know, I won't be able to match my versatility. When you first went independent, there was very little in terms of precedent or blueprint for people doing that in mm -hmm. hip hop mm -hmm. and achieving any, you know, real significant level of success. Right. Was there anyone that you were looking at for inspiration, sort of how you built the paradigm? Master P definitely kind of like set the tone for things of that nature. Guys like 36 Mafia, E-40, the whole Bay Area. The Bay kind of showed me that you didn't have to be on a major label to be a rich rapper. Cause that's when, I, you know, when I moved out here, I was like seeing like rich ass rappers that I had never heard of. And I was like, damn, you know what I'm saying? 
shit, I want to be one of them. I don't really give a fuck if you heard of me or not. How do I get rich off of just rapping? At the beginning of this independent part of your career, how hand to mouth were things? How low were the funds? It was fucked up, man. Sleeping on homies' couches, stuff like that. Definitely got to scrape and survive when, you, you know, rap is an expensive thing to do. Shit, name me like five rappers that like took the same path that I took. A lot of these motherfuckers got to get, you know, they got some like big homie with them, funding them, things of that nature, you know? I was the big homie and the, the talent at the same time. Were you concerned, I mean, doing what you had to do in order to fund this, that that was gonna end up getting you caught up? Nope, I pray every day, so. I saw this a long time ago when I was a child, so I knew it was gonna, you know, come into fruition at some point. I can't say I didn't look at nothing that I was doing was bad, because it was definitely bad. Everybody take a different path to where they gotta go. I just had to go on that one. Sheesh. <laughs> I, I try not to take none of those uh, techniques and tactics into the music industry if I can, but uh, <laughs> in anything in life, man, you gotta like work harder and you gotta have a good work ethic, man. And I you know, had a, a, a fear of not being successful in this. I was afraid that shit, I was, you know, doing that other shit so much that that's all I would be able to do. And I didn't want that. I rap like my life depend on it, because it do. When you find something uh, way more important than, you know, you don't even think about that life no more. What was the project that you felt like, okay, I've, I've reached a stability? Pinata. Definitely. I, I made that, it was like, okay, all right, I'm a rapper. Checks and stuff is starting to come in, like people starting to like notice. People starting to know who I am. I think that uh, it uh, made me a better rapper. Opened my eyes up to different production, new things, new ways of rapping, um, just taking risks musically. What is it that Mad Lib pulls out of you that makes it so special? It takes me out of my zone. I don't know, I can't really, Describe it until you like rap on like one of his beats. Like I like make you feel. It's an energy thing, man. You know what I mean? Like me and him got a real connection. When I'm in a room making music with him, I don't know, I just I feel different. And damn it like I got superpowers and some shit like that. So he kinda unlock something that uh maybe I couldn't unlock without him. Him and uh him and Alchemist. I'm not one that's um hard to direct, so both of those guys can run me to play and I will deliver whatever they need me to do. Do you ever deal with like writer's block? When I got writer's block, I just don't even fuck with rapping. God, right, I need to go live some life. I need to go play in the dirt for a little while. I need to go to strip club, fuck some bitches. I need to go to the block. I need to go experience some shit. Cause all of this shit is based off experience. These guys words, bro. I'm just the vessel. I'm just carrying this shit. When I got writer's block or I don't feel inspired, I go get inspired. Success is just being happy. When you get to the point where you're like uh, content with uh, where you're at, I think you, you know, you reach that. Despite his early unceremonious exit from the major label system and the indie success it would birth, in mid-2020, Gibbs signed an artist-friendly deal with Warner Records. Concurrently, his collaboration with Alchemist, Alfredo, would secure a Grammy nomination for Best Rap Album. So now, with merch releases, brand partnerships, acting opportunities, and a burgeoning record label, not to mention his music, Gibbs finds himself approaching 40 at the zenith of his career. You were signed to a major label. Mm -hmm. It went sideways and ended poorly. You then were under another rapper that ended poorly. Mm -hmm. Then you had a string of real success, independent. Yeah. But then you ended up signing to not only one, but two major labels in the last few years. <laughs> Did you have any sort of trepidation about that? Not a fucking all, because I do it the way I want to do it. So I just look at it like, hey, it's just nothing personal, just business at this point. It was about the leverage now. You know, I'm a viable, sellable product at this point. I wasn't that in 2006, so I wasn't ready. To be honest, I probably shouldn't have had a record deal at that point. I wasn't ready yet. By the grace of God, I got ready. Now nah, stay ready. And you now own your own masters? <laughs> Everything. How does that feel? I feel like I could just wake up and say fuck everybody if I want to. Every company I do business with, they know I don't really, I don't need them. They know if we doing something, it's mutual. It's a mutual feeling, it's a mutual partnership. 
you've now been in the trifecta, right? You've, you've been signed to Universal, yeah. Sony, and uh, Warner. Are there any differences between the major labels in your Fuck opinion? Fuck no. All that shit is the same. If you're not a sellable product, they don't give a fuck about you anyway. So you gotta become that for yourself. It's all well and good to do business with these organizations, but we, you know, as black people, we definitely gotta change the way we do business with these people. That's my outlook on it. Were you surprised when you got the Grammy now? Hell yeah. I don't imagine you had a Grammy campaign or anything like that. No fucking way. I don't know <laughs> shit about that. So like, they, you know, when they nominated me, I was like, what the fuck? So, you know. Now I just want to just throw that shit in everybody's face. Like, look, motherfucker, guess what? You know what I'm saying? So that was amazing to me. Um, trophy or not, you know, the fact that they came down to the underground and saw what the fuck I was doing and recognized it, like, shit, I ain't mad at that. You've grown your merch business from being almost non-existent to quite robust in the last, like, 18, 24 months. That's crazy, right? Did you guys sit down and put together a strategy to grow that business? Me and Lambo just wanted to just be more creative with it. We took something that was like kind of like not uh, apparent and turned it into like a seven figure business for us because we uh, just start paying attention to it. We built a fucking brand and like we got to nurture every aspect of it, not just the musical side of it. So once we start nurturing the um, other aspects of the business, they started to grow. You've done a lot of really cutting edge marketing moves over the last few years. One of them jumped out is the, you know, the burger with the toy and- The rabbit. Yeah, the rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> like, where did these ideas come from? Me and Lambo, we talk every morning, uh, like clockwork, brainstorming. That's uh, been the grand nature of our relationship in the past, you know, 15 years, man, is that we, you know, shit, we like 90s kids at heart. We got so much in common, but we so different and like, I can't wake up to like share something with him. He can't wake up to share something with me. And that that relationship is, you know, uh, you know, that's priceless. We want to market gangster rap in a different kind of way. When you put out a record like Alfredo, do you have like a, a, a year long marketing plan in mind? I got a lifelong marketing plan for all my projects. I want to make it a full experience and I want you to love what I just you know, put together, you know, like a movie, like a film. I can do a goddamn pinata tour right now and just do those songs and all my fans gonna show up. I can do a bandana tour right now. 10 years later, yo, I'm just only gonna perform Alfredo. All right, cool. They gonna show up. So the brand lives on, pinata lives on, bandana lives on, like Alfredo lives on, you know, those three classic albums. So it's just, you know, giving them something that they can attach themselves to everything at the end of the day is, is is marketing that's a huge portion of making the music because you can make some hard shit and if you package it up wrong it might go over my fucking head i might miss it or you can make some bullshit and package it up correctly and i might get a whiff of that but you know at the end of the day i'm gonna get it i'm understanding this bullshit was pinata sort of the inflection point where you had that epiphany definitely they fuck with the zebra shit. Let me run with this shit. I had like some zebra dice that kind of inspired that. And then I was like chopping up this cocaine on like this like black table. And then like I seen it, it was like, oh, this shit look kind of like zebra stripes. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I kind of like combined that whole marketing idea with that. What's the most satisfying part of being a recording artist? The joy I get out of it is just uh, having a job where I do what I want to do. I ain't got no boss or nothing like that. I get to like get my thoughts out and uh, you know, it's kind of therapeutic for me. I got my office right in the next room. I could wake up and make an album tonight and put it out if I want to. So I record all my shit at bed. What's your process for writing? I just like listen to the beat for a long time and then just go in there and just say, just say what I gotta say. But I don't like write, I don't like use like paper and nothing like that. So it's all in your head? Pretty much, yeah. I'll just go in there and do what I gotta do. A lot of young niggas these days, they like to record like right next to the engineer and all that shit, had a mic in the room, I don't like that shit. I just go in the booth. So I feel like I'm like by myself. You're midway through recording your 10th or so album, <laughs> but also your major label debut. That's crazy. 
<laughs> to even think about it, I'm like, damn, for real? Wow. What are you doing on this record in terms of production or in terms of vision that you feel like separates it from the stuff you've done independently or the stuff you've done collaboratively? I'm definitely working with a, a lot bigger producers, for sure. Just left fucking for real. <laughs> Doesn't get much bigger than that. Doesn't get much bigger than that, man. You know what I mean? That's astronomical. I was just with P. Diddy the other day. This album is just definitely a little bit more bossed up for sure. I just did a song with Sway Lee. You know what I mean? That's fucking crazy. Like people would never picture some of the combinations that I'm gonna come with on this album, but they're gonna appreciate them. They're gonna be like, oh, okay, yeah, I didn't know I needed that. But like I said, man, I'm not gonna divert from anything that I've been doing. You know what I mean? I'm gonna give deliver the same uh, you know, solid material that I've been doing, you know, the past, shit, five, six albums. Has parenthood changed your approach to art? Definitely. Shit. Like I said, I'm, I'm not just working for myself anymore. You know, I'm working for my kids. I would say it changed it in that regard, but, um, you know, I still like the same gangsta ass shit, just as a nigga that got babies now, so. What have your kids taught you? That I gotta come home. The stakes is higher for me to live now. Where does acting fit into your endeavors? Oh man, it's uh, gonna be a huge thing for me. I just shot my first lead role. Me being a rapper and um, you know delivering the, you know those emotions in the booth kind of like helped me um, when it came to you know uh, learning how to deliver my emotions in the uh, film world. The director Diego Angaro, he really like pushed me in this film and really like helped me to uh, get real comfortable with being an actor. Now, you know, shit, I wouldn't mind doing that shit every day. Have you watched the film yet? Not at all, I can't. I don't even think I'm gonna be able to watch it. I don't know, I can't look at myself on screen. I get embarrassed and shit. <laughs> if you ask me, have I ever like watched any of my performance tapes? Fuck no. Okay. I can't look at it. And I just do it and I just keep it, keep it moving. You know so what, I mean? what was the part of acting that gave you kind of the satisfaction and the joy? I'm so in the films and in the, you know, things of that nature. So just to, to be a part of one, you know, finally was, uh, you know, it, it was a blessing, man. So when you look at the next few years of your life and your career, what are the challenges and the goals that you have for yourself? Making a lot of uh, money, man. Uh, just being able to be here for my kids, really, to be honest, man. Um, being so productive that I got a lot of time to be with my kids. Long as I can, like, you know, make things that's gonna, like, set me straight, that's all that really matters to me. The film thing is uh, something that I gotta work on, work harder at. Is there anything that you look back at your career that you would do differently? Mm. No, not at all. Everything happened the way it was supposed to happen. I'm supposed to be at the top of my game right now, you know, not 10 years ago, not five years ago. Everything that I ever wanted, I'm supposed to get it now. I'm glad to be, you know, getting my accolades and things, you know, I don't want to say late in my career because shit, I feel like I'm just getting started. I've just been fortunate enough to have a longer one than most of these motherfuckers. You are extremely hot right now. You've been very cold at times in your career. Mm -hmm. What did those moments teach you? Just to never give up, man. I knew what I had, and um, Lambo always knew what I had. I wasn't ever gonna give up on it. I wasn't ever gonna let time deter me from um, getting where I wanted to be. I still got the energy to, to do this. I still got the energy to make great music. And the shit is fucking wide open, dog. Do you still get the same sense of accomplishment and fulfillment from it? Yeah, definitely. Definitely, especially when I perform. You know, that's the ultimate fulfillment. You see a bunch of people that got off work, went and got an outfit, paid their hard earned money, probably went and got a fucking babysitter for their kids to come see you. That's why you do it. You work so hard to bring, you know, a, a moment or a piece of joy to somebody else that's working hard. And that's it right there.